we are going to be focusing on specific neighborhoods in Cleveland. And so today we are going to start with the Huff neighborhood. And specifically today's agenda, we'll be talking about the history of Huff neighborhood. So we'll do this in two parts, hopefully. Uh, we will do a pre-1966 Huff, which is uh, pre-uprising, the 1966 uprising. And then hopefully if Mr. Freeman can join us, we will do a post-1966 um, historical discussion on the Huff neighborhood and entrepreneurship. So <clears throat> I will begin to introduce our first guest. He is both a public and academic historian. He is the Senior Vice President for Research and Publications at the Western Reserve Historical Society. And he's also a professor here at, a professor in history here at Case Western Reserve University. He is the editor of the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History. And he also created the first uh, history archive, <clears throat> one of the first history archives for black history in America at the Western Reserve Historical Society. I believe that was 71. So if you will all please join me in welcoming Professor John Grabowski to the discussion. Hi, Daryl. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. It's good to be here. Um, and, and it's good to put Huff into a broader perspective. Uh, and I think we'll want to discuss that in a while. Uh, that did play a role in the creation of the African American History Archives, but uh, that's uh, that's something that the Historical Society began uh, nearly 50 years ago, and it, it has been a great archive for the community. And I say community in the broadest sense of the word. The Historical Society has gone on to build ethnic history archives, LGBTQ archives, so forth. But if I'm going to look at, at Huff, and, and today Huff is defined as the area between East 55th and East 105th Street and north to south between Euclid and Superior. So it's quite a swath of uh, land. But we have to put that into, a, I think, a, a, a longer context. Of, it really didn't begin as a neighborhood per se until the 1870s. And its creation as a neighborhood, as a real estate development was a consequence of the city's growth. And, and let me just give you some boring figures, but they're, they're interesting to know. Uh, 1820, uh, Cleveland's population was 606, and, and most of the population in the city at that time was clustered around Public Square, part, primarily to the west of Public Square. But as the city began to expand after industries developed because of the canal and the railroad, that population began to spread eastward, and when Ohio City was annexed, it spread westward. And what one sees with the spread of population over time, this is a general rule, is that as the central, as, as industry and commerce grow, the central city begins to be taken over by that. And residential life for those who can afford it moves further away from the center. So what you're looking at by the 1850s and 1860s are people moving out to the, what we would call the East 30th and East 40th areas on the east side. And on the west side, Ohio City is annexed and that begins to move out. But by 1870, the city's progress and its growth is really enormous. Let me just give you the numbers here. City's population in 1870 is 92,829. By 1900, it is 381,768. I can give you all these numbers, but let's just say that by 1940, it's 878,000. And by 1950, Cleveland achieves its largest population as, as a city of 914,000 people. Uh, and so as that population begins to grow, real estate brokers buy the farmlands that are around Cleveland. You have to imagine that Cleveland was established to be a farming village, and the outer lots were 100 acre lots. And uh, by 1870, the pressure is on, and the movement has gone all the way out to East 55th Street, then Wilson Avenue. And it's at that point that Huff Avenue is created. It's actually uh, created in 1873. Um, and it's dedicated to Oliver and Eliza Huff, who were early settlers to the city. Um, 1799 is the date that we have. And that area that is now east of uh, East 55th Street was once part of East Cleveland Township, but it's annexed to the city of Cleveland at the same time. So what you have is the city is spatially expanding. And when the avenue is developed as real estate, uh, it is developed as a sort of upper middle class area. And there are two things to look for uh, when, when you see Huff be, being developed, is that Huff Avenue and then Lexington Avenue as well, the main 
east-west streets are going to become avenues of commerce. Uh, this, the neighborhood grows up as a walking neighborhood. Now, there will be streetcars that come, most notably a cable car system that's run by a man, Frank DeHaas Robeson, and he builds it out to his ballpark, which is also in Huff Lee Park Field, as we know it now. Uh, but shopping and business were all indigenous and, and local to the community. So the main streets were basically streets of stores, everything from groceries to cleaners to whatever. And, and the toniness of the neighborhood at that time is sort of set by the fact that a university school actually starts out in Huff in 1890 and will remain in the Huff neighborhood until 1926. If you know the area today, um, you, you can see if you go very far east on East 89th Street and drive down East 89th Street, there are magnificent homes on East 89th Street. So like almost every other real estate development in Cleveland, the housing is built and parceled out to those who can afford it. And Huff is primarily white. It is primarily non-ethnic. It's quite interesting because as the city expands, we see the ethnic neighborhoods of Cleveland growing out along the railroad line. So if you go to the north of Huff and you get to St. Clair Superior with the Lakeshore Railroad, that turns into a series of factories which become Slovenian, Croatian, Serbian, and Polish. Uh, on the other side of Huff, however, is Euclid Avenue, which is known as Cleveland's Millionaire's Row. And that is where many of the wealthy in Cleveland, including Rockefeller and Small House, uh, the Severances and others build their mansions along this green swarded street. So that is at the southern border of Huff. So you get a sense of, of where it's, it's situated at that time. But the thing to uh, think for, to understand about Huff and any neighborhood in Cleveland is that the city's population is never static. It doesn't stop growing until 1950. And when it does grow, it grows because of an influx of people, immigrants and migrants. And let's look at that for a while. Because the neighborhoods in which the factories are, are operating, the transportation systems are operating, the flats, for instance, the borders on the flats, uh, are basically the areas where there may have been good housing to begin with, but then it ends up being immigrant housing for the people who have to live where they walk to work. Now, Huff is a bit absent that um, because it is kind of a suburban neighborhood. And uh, so by 1920, when Cleveland is the fifth largest city in the United States and the value of its industrial production is fifth largest, we need to look at the nationality and the breakdown demographically of the population. And if we break that down, we find out that two thirds of the population of the city of Cleveland is either of foreign birth or foreign parentage. Another 35,000 people are African American and they're part of the first great migration. And this brings in the story that we'll get to with uh, Mr. Freeman, uh, is the African-American population in Cleveland is initially quite small. In 1860, it's 800 people. Uh, Cleveland prides itself because it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. There is written proof of that. It's a strong anti-slavery, not just, a, but not an abolitionist sentiment in the city. And by the post-Civil War period, African-Americans who had lived here, who came here, in the years of 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, were relatively well integrated into the city. That doesn't mean there weren't pockets of them. The African-American community begins to coalesce along what would be the western end of Cedar Road, around Woodland and Broadway at that point. But as Cleveland moves through the 19th century, two other factors influence African-American migration to the city. One is the reimposition of Jim Crow in the South after the uh, after Reconstruction is wholly abandoned with the uh, election of 1876, uh, that deprives Blacks of those freedoms that they've had for a brief period of time. And it also begins to reassert a, a, a culture of white dominance. So African Americans do much the same as European immigrants do, except for different reasons in some ways. They begin to be attracted to industrial cities in the North, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, and Cleveland among them not only for jobs, but for the understanding, mistaken understanding in many instances that they would be treated better in Northern cities than they would in the South. So if we're looking at the growth of African-American population in Cleveland, the number of African-Americans in the city in 1870 is 1,293. 
By 1900, it is nearly 6,000. 20 years later, in 1920, the population is 30, nearly 35,000, 34,400. And what we're looking at is a movement initially from the border states and then from the deep south. And Cleveland has a nickname as Alabama North. Uh, there's a great book on it by Kimberly Phillips, a great scholarly work on it. But what has happened by the 1900s, 1910s, is you begin to see de facto move to segregation in Cleveland. African Americans, even noted ones like John P. Green, find that places are closing to them. Amusement park like Luna Park has a colored day only. Uh, the city counters those uh, movements with laws that, that supposedly bar that type of discrimination. But nevertheless, by the 1930s, Cleveland's African American population, which by 1940 will be 84,000, is largely sequestered into one area. And that's what we would call Fairfax and Cedar Central. Uh, from really downtown out to University Circle, that is Cleveland's African American community. But what happens in the 1940s is a second great migration. And often when we're speaking about the African American great migration, we, we focus on that one that occurred from the 1870s up to World War I into the 1920s. And then with the collapse of the economy in 1929, it goes somewhat quiescent. But the key to understanding the second great migration is A, the United States ramping up for World War II production at that point, and, and B, continued pressures in the South, uh, pushing African Americans away. Chicago gets a huge population of African Americans, but this is not a peaceable process. 1943, Detroit, there are riots against African Americans. It happens in Harlem as well. In 1919, there were riots in Chicago. Cleveland is, is free of those riots. And one of the reasons that African-Americans come in larger numbers to sit industrial cities like Cleveland in the 1920s and then during the Second World War is the fact that the United States has severely restricted immigration uh, with the 1921 and 24 quota acts uh, in the 20s. And then during World War II, there is no way that one can get workers outside of, from the United States. So one sees the city of Cleveland shifting demographically in World War II in significant ways. First, the large Hispanic population begins out in uh, Lorraine with uh, people from Puerto Rico, and they are actually brought in by invitation of the United States Steel. Uh, Puerto Rico is an American commonwealth, so they are allowed to migrate in. The black migration in Cleveland is still largely from the deep south at this point, and what we will find is that by 1950, the population of blacks in Cleveland has risen from 84,000 to 148,000. And if we extrapolate both to 1960, it's 250,818. Now, Cleveland is dealing with race issues and housing during World War II. Housing is extremely overcrowded. There's emergency housing built near what is now the IX Center to house people working in the aircraft plant there. But if you look at the record, the pressure is really on African Americans to find decent housing during World War II, and that becomes a problem. And issues of discrimination and segregation continue. Uh, there's something called the Euclid Beach Park riot in 1947, when African Americans are, are protesting the discrimination against mixed couples at the roller rink and the, swim, and the uh, beach at the Euclid Beach Park. The city starts a community relations board, uh, the seemingly the right things happen in Cleveland. The baseball team hire, brings in Larry Doby and Satchel Page. The Cleveland Browns start as an integrated football team. And in 1950s, an early issue of Jet Magazine uh, talks about Cleveland as a good city for Negroes. But that is, is not going to continue because the population pressures in Cedar Central are beginning to move people beyond the boundaries of Cedar Central. Uh, Urban renewal in Cedar Central is displacing many people. And one of the neighborhoods that begins to grow a black population is Huff. And Huff's population in 1950 is 5% minority. In 1960, it is 74% minority. The same situation is happening in Glenville. And, and the reason the, the the neighborhoods shift this rapidly. There's two things. One is Huff is growing into an older neighborhood. It is already nearly 70, 80 years old in some parts of it. So it's an older neighborhood. 
And the other thing that, that is happening is that real estate companies are taking advantage of white prejudice and neighborhoods that are changing, Huff and Glenville. The, the gambit for a real estate dealer is to go up and down the street and to indicate that African-Americans are buying houses. It's probably the only place they could buy houses because of redlining. And, and because of that, your housing values are going to go down. Now, each sale is, is, a, is basically, partially, it's, it's a bonus for the real estate agent. That is happening. Another thing, less nefarious, that is driving people out of the city, and you'll see the city population, is the creation of new highway networks and suburbs. So the old inner ring suburbs, there are only five of them, and that would be Lakewood, East Cleveland, Cleveland Heights, and Shaker Heights are now joined by suburbs that are further out, reached by highways. Automobiles are affordable. GI bills, the GI bill makes home loans easy for white Americans. And so they begin to move out of what many people mistakenly would call the old good old neighborhood, which often was next to the railroad tracks, next to the steel mills. The people who are left in the city are African Americans. And so what happens in a community like Huff as it shifts, there's several things to look at. One, as African Americans are moving up to Cleveland in the 1950s and 1960s for industrial jobs, jobs are beginning to leave the city. And then again, African Americans are having problems getting into unions. As a matter of fact, in the early 1960s, the United, United Freedom Movement in Cleveland pickets a uh, construction site on the mall, uh, asking for more African American jobs there. They picket the school system uh, because of de facto segregation in the school system. And a white clergyman named Bruce Clunder is killed at a school protest on Lakeview Avenue in Glendale when a bulldozer backs over him. So even before the uprising in Huff, things are beginning to rise up in Cleveland in terms of jobs and privileges. And Huff is being characterized even before the uprising by an article in the Cleveland Plain Dealer as a potential powder keg. And this is basically an independent report. You know, this, in 1965, the Cleveland Press reported that Huff was in crisis. So this is one year before the uprising. Uh, what you're finding is fewer city services, uh, rodent infestations, uh, no garbage pickup at times, basically people being neglected. And there's another thing that happens in changing neighborhoods, to use that euphemism, is that while many homeowners will move out, they'll do one of two things. They may keep the old home and divide it up and market it at an extremely high rental place to accommodate the growing population. And indeed, by 1957, there are an estimated 83,000 people in Huff. The numbers for Huff are basically 65,000 in 1950, 83,000 in 1957, and in 2012, 12,594. That's the rise and fall of Huff. But if we get to business owners in these neighborhoods, whether it's Cedar Central or whether it's Huff, most business owners are white. They will retain their business even though they're living out of the community. And their employment practices and their pricing practices are problematic. And that was an issue that was already taken on in the 1930s in basically Cedar Central by a man named John O. Holly. Holly was a relatively recent African-American migrant from the Deep South. And he basically started a movement called the United Freedom Movement. And they pioneered something in Cleveland that became very common later. They pioneered uh, boycott and picketing. They would go to white-owned stores within Cedar Central along Woodland Avenue that were not employing African Americans, and they would march with signs saying, don't, don't shop where you can't work. And eventually, that opened some jobs for African Americans. A little interesting tidbit here is John O. Hawley became a mentor for Mayor Carl Stokes in the late 1940s. Hawley was uh, stumping the state for a candidate for governor, and he had a young man named Carl Burton Stokes as his driver. And that's where Carl Stokes basically began to learn about the deeper history of the community. Uh, Huff is in this situation, and this is where I, I will end it, unless we have more. Uh, if, uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Freeman will be here. Uh, 
Prior to the Hup Hup uprising, there were other ones in the United States. Perhaps the most notable one was Watts in Los Angeles in 1965. And these were for the same reasons. Uh, the uprising in Huff began on the 18th of July, 1966. It would, four people, all African-American would die. And there were 300 arrested, 200 fires were found, and there were $1.2 million in property damage. But even before this, in the ethnic neighborhoods around Huff, there were issues. And there's a neighborhood called Sawinski, which was largely Polish-American. And at one point, uh, uh, shortly before Huff, if I recall correctly, there were some African-American kids throwing stones at cars, and one car with a couple of white guys uh, pulled out their guns and took some shots at the kids. So there was this tension between our hood and their hood that was going on at this point. But what really broke the camels, proverbial camels back, was in a hot day in a hot summer in 1966, an African-American went into the 79er Cafe at 79th and Huff Avenue and asked for a glass of water and was refused that glass of water. Uh, went out and the owner then put a sign up saying, I'll put it politely, no, no, no water for colored. That brought a group of young people outside the, the tavern. They began to protest. The police came out to break the protest down and that was the nub of the riot, which was not only in Huff, but it spread around the city. Uh, one African-American man, Benares Tony, uh, was driving, got lost in Little Italy, was shot, killed. Uh, his, kill his killer was acquitted. So this is the mixed situation you have. There are rumors that Little Italy was already arming at this point. Uh, busing for schools had begun, not busing, but moving. Schools were overcrowded and where African-Americans were brought to Little Italy schools. Uh, there were street, street protests and street fracases that occurred at that point. So the city was primed and ready to go. It was problematic. You had a huge African-American black underclass uh, looking for a way up and a way out, and everything seemed to be blocked in their way. And Daryl, I think that's about my background for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That was a lot of info. Uh, Mr. Don Freeman, are you with us? I'm, I'm with you. Good, great. Hello. Uh, how are you? you hear me, Don Freeman? I'm with you. I can hear you. How are you? Okay, I'm glad, to, glad that I'm, I'm hooked up with you now. That's great. All right. Were you able to hear uh, Professor? Yes, I heard most of what uh, Dr. Grabowski, uh, Grabowski said, yes. All right, wonderful. So, um, we can go ahead and let you carry it from here if you're ready. I'll do the best I can. Now, one thing that I want to stress to begin with is that after the Huff uprising, there were no longer any Jewish or European American entrepreneurs who were willing to invest uh, and in, invest any money, involve themselves in any enterprises in the Huff area. So what was essentially necessary was the intervention of the federal government in the form of development corporations in various areas. And of course, one of the uh, earliest areas that the federal government intervened in terms of development corporations was the health area, which meant that around late 1968, Reverend DeForest Brown and other health activists were able to receive subsidization from the U.S. government to begin the health development corporation in Huff. 
they essentially had a headquarters in um, Huff that eventually became established at, in, a, in a building on Euclid Avenue uh, near 71st Street. And with this building as a headquarters, they essentially began imp implementing um, certain enterprises, enterprises located primarily at the, let's say, intersection of both Crawford Avenue and Wade Park. And this complex, which they essentially uh, developed at that location of Crawford Avenue and Way Park, included a grocery store and some other enterprises that I don't remember any longer, but I primarily remember the grocery store. And pretty much as an integral part of that complex, they developed some apartments in which some Huff residents resided. Now, near there, they were able to establish a McDonald's franchise, which wasn't actually located in, in Huff. The, the, the employees came from Huff, but the enterprise was located uh, at about 107th in Euclid. And the person that they hired to essentially manage these enterprise these enterprises was Franklin Anderson who had gotten an MBA from um, Harvard so this this essentially is what was ensuing in the early 19 70s, uh, in, in the mid-1970s. Now, then there was one person who was willing to start to implement a privately owned um, enterprise connected with the Huff area. Uh, his name was Nate Smith, and he uh, essentially uh, developed an industrial plant that was connected with General Motors, and it was uh, manufacturing rubber products for uh, General Motors, and that was established uh, near the headquarters of the uh, Huff Development Corporation at 70. First and Euclid, it was located in the area, let's say around 69th and Euclid or, be, or below that. Uh, and it, but anyway, in, 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 in the, uh, the area of 69th and Euclid. And he later moved his enterprise out into a suburban area, but he essentially still employed people from Huff. Now, Later, the Huff Area Development Corporation uh, moved from the 71st and Euclid location to a location about 87th in Huff in a building that had formerly been a part of, uh, had formerly been owned and utilized by the city government uh, 
in terms of the uh, community development department of the city. But this location was at about 87th and Huff. And then later the uh, director became Claude Banks. Now, unfortunately, uh, in terms of the implementation of the housing development that the Huff Area Development Corporation was involved in, there occurred dissension between the Huff Area, Huff Area Development Corporation uh, under the uh, directorship of Claude uh, Banks and then Councilwoman Fanny Lewis. So as a consequence of that, unfortunately, the Huff Area, Huff Area Development Corporation was uh, essentially uh, undermined and it uh, it e essentially terminated. But Councilwoman Fanny Lewis strived to continue the housing developments that essentially the Huff Area uh, Development Corporation had uh, implemented. But what really uh, became a, a major housing development thanks to Councilwoman Fannie Lewis is what is now known as the uh, Lexington Village, uh, which obviously now uh, has a, a housing that extends from about 73rd and Huff up to 79th and Huff, uh, over to 79th and Lexington, and then extends further across uh, off from 79th and, and Huff up to about 81st and Huff. So that constitutes a response that was implemented to, let's say, address the economic crisis that was the aftermath of the Huff uprising. And of course, what still is primarily the remnants of that process constitutes the housing that uh, Councilwoman Fannie Lewis was instrumental in um, implementing. And of course, what what you have in conjunction with what Fannie Lewis was able to implement in terms of of housing is continued housing that has been developed north of Chester, beginning about let's say uh, eighty. Uh, well, basically about, let's say, 73rd in Chester. So that constitutes what I fundamentally can uh, contribute in terms of the discussion today or, or the program today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, joining us for the call today. And uh, let me just take a step back <clears throat> really quick and, and reintroduce you. <laughs> so my apologies for that. Um, That's so okay. Everybody in the audience, we uh, just listened to Mr. Don Freeman. He is an education activist and lifelong Cleveland resident. Uh, he went to Glenville High School, and he's also a graduate of Case Western Reserve University, I believe with a degree in history. So we mm -hmm. share that together. Um, he's also the author of Reflections of a Resolute Radical, uh, which is depicting his life as a youth in Cleveland and his work in the civil rights movement. So uh, once again, thank you for joining us. And at this point, we're going to open this up to uh, discussion questions from everybody on the panel and in the audience. Looks like we have one here. 
how did <clears throat> this is a, a question from Carol? Okay. And uh, I, I believe whoever has the answer can take it. Uh, did Huff Bakery start their business in the Huff area? I believe so, and I'm just checking on that right now. No, their pile. Actually, they expanded it. Let's, yep. Started in 1903 at 8708 Huff Avenue. So there's the answer. Thank you. Uh, anybody in the audience, if you have a question, you can either use the, I don't know if there's the raise hand function on here or not. You can uh, type them into the chat and I will uh, ask them for you. Okay, this question is from Robin. Thank you. How has the residential makeup of Huff changed over time? What's that course again? How does the, uh, the, 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 the residential makeup of Huff, how has it changed over time? Well, again, as uh, Professor uh, Grabowski had indicated that by 1960, it uh, essentially had it become primarily Afro -Amer African American, and that's what fundamentally that um, it still is. However, I think what we have a factor now is the expansion of Cleveland Clinic, mm -hmm. um, obviously in terms of the southern and southeastern uh, Huff area. And with that, Cleveland Clinic's uh, interest and concern with some of its employees being able to reside in the Huff area where they will be closer to Cleveland Clinic. So that I would say now the expansion of Cleveland Clinic and its concern is, and its concern with its employees being able to reside in what is now the eastern and, 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 and uh, southeastern of uh, if they choose to, that's the fact that over time will probably result in some change from exclusively an African American uh, residential uh, population in Huff to more inclusion of uh, European Americans. Thank you. All right, we have another question here from Gina. Thank you. Uh, were blacks in the Cleveland area denied access to the GI Bill for loans as, has hap as happened in other parts of the country? Yeah, it was it was difficult for them to get loans. Um, and the best book on this, and I'll refer you to a great author, his name is Todd Mishney. And it's a history of African-American suburbanization in Cleveland called Surrogate Suburbs. And it covers the period from 1900 into the uh, 1980s. Uh, it's an exceedingly good book. Uh, and I know there's another question that came up about redlining. And Todd deals with, with redlining, not not only in suburban growth, but its effect on the inner city as well. Uh, so I'd highly recommend that. Thank you. And so we have another question, um, and hopefully I'm saying your name correctly, Allah. Would you like to uh, unmute and ask uh, the panelists the question? Sure, um, hi everyone. Hi. Um, I was wondering, to what extent the redlining that you all have spoken about a consequence of local legislation or municipal legislation and how much of it was due to any kind of collective prejudice that landlords property owners had thank you well it's it's interesting it has it has a uh, it has a not a local origin but there was a real property inventory of greater cleveland 
uh, did surveys of the city in the 1920s and 1930s uh, looking at wealth in areas and, and that led to uh, a basis for redlining. But as my understanding is redlining is a national policy that came up during the FDR administration. So it has impacted all major cities. Thank you. Just a moment here. Question. So I have a question and <clears throat> Mr. Freeman, I, you brought this up uh, a little bit. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about the impact of the Cleveland Clinic um, and how has that helped for, like what is the impact of the Cleveland Clinic on Huff for better, for worse over the years? Okay, now I um, want to stress that some Huff residents are alarmed by it in terms of uh, Huff residents who have, have chosen to remain in Huff and not move from the Huff area. They are alarmed. Now, one other uh, essential uh, comment I do want to make is that Cleveland Clinic is having some economic impact upon, let's say, the southeastern uh, areas of Huff in terms of uh, enterprises along Chester Avenue, which uh, obviously are a consequence of the uh, Cleveland Clinic's involvement. So that I would say that the, I'll call the veteran of residential population that has chosen to remain in Huff and not leave the Huff area, uh, they are somewhat apprehensive relative to Cleveland Clinic's uh, advancement uh, or, or, or when I say advancement, it's expansion, which they uh, essentially regard as intrusive. Are they so? As a follow-up to that question, is it is it a concern about being displaced by the Cleveland Clinic, or what is their apprehension? Um, okay, they they are concerned uh, to some extent about residential displacement uh, in terms of the extent to which uh, various units that are the various housing that is implemented in the southern or the southeastern areas of, of are too expensive for the existing residents to essentially purchase. So I would say from that standpoint, they are considering it as as a kind of de, uh, gentr uh, gentrification. Yeah. Understood, thank you. Um, we have another question from our audience. Uh, Brittany, would you like to um, go ahead and ask it? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, as a, a new resident, um, my husband and I, our family just moved in and um, uh, just looking at the um, expansion and impact of the Cleveland Clinic, and you kind of touched on this already, but uh, what direction do you see um, the neighborhood moving in? Is it, uh, I just go back and forth with whether the Cleveland Clinic expansion is a positive one, or um, like you said, some of the residents are kind of alarmed due to possible displacement. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Okay, I think the best response 
for me to make is that overall it is perceived that the additional housing which and when I say that I I'm I'm talking about housing that was generated by the efforts of councilwoman Fannie Lewis uh, especially and and other people who have chosen to um build houses in the Huff area I can think specifically of people like a former um Cleveland uh, Police uh, Department uh, commander of the 5th District who who had uh, who built a house on um, Chester uh, in, in, in the up area. That overall, the housing uh, aspect has been positive, even with the critique that I'm more or less including relative to the Cleveland Clinic. I think what is challenging is uh, the lack of facilities such as drug stores and even uh, grocery stores um, in the Huff area. There's still you do not have still anywhere near the kind of diversity in economic enterprises that existed prior to the uprising of 1966 in the Huff area. That that has not been, uh, in terms of renovation, that has not occurred. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're getting close to time here. So um, <clears throat> we'll ask one more question, and um, and then I'll give you the audience some more information about the last two parts of the series, which will take place tomorrow and this coming Thursday, which I'll fill you in on. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to ask, <clears throat> I think, Mr. Freeman, this would be mainly for you, um, but since we have an audience here of about 60 people, I thought maybe this might be an appropriate question. And that is, how can the greater community at large be part of the solution to help restore Huff and other neighborhoods in Cleveland like it back to Providence? Okay, I think um, the response that I'll make is obviously uh, the Huff area would appreciate the let's say, addition, and with them being the addition, uh, their involvement in implementing the kinds of improvements that I'm talking about in in terms of uh, doing what's necessary to cause uh, grocery stores and um, other enterprises like drug stores to be established in 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 Huff in the Huff area. Uh, the best way I guess I can put that is that in terms of the presence of such a new population. Them, them functioning in such a way in which they are able to effectively indicate to people who are willing to invest money uh, to in, in, invest in grocery stores and, and, and drug stores and uh, that's about the best way I can put it uh, in, in terms of what would be a welcome addition to the hot area? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Like I said, this was the first part of a three-part series.